Fans of Mindhunter and True Crime Podcasts will devour these chilling stories of serial killers from the American Golden Age, 1950 to 2000. With books like Serial Killers, Female Serial Killers, and Sons of Cain, Peter Vronsky has established himself as the foremost expert on the history of serial killers. In his first definitive history of the golden age of American serial murder, when the number and body count of serial killers exploded, Vronsky tells the stories of the most unusual and prominent serial killings from the 1950s to the early 21st century. From Ted Bundy to the Golden State Killer, our fascination with these classic serial killers seems to grow by the day. American Serial Killers gives true crime junkies what they crave, with both perennial favorites Ed Kemper, Jeffrey Dahmer, and lesser-known cases Melvin Reese, Harvey Glattman. The book that we're featuring this evening is American Serial Killers, The Epidemic Years, 1950 to 2000, with my special guest historian, journalist, and author, Peter Vronsky. Welcome to the program, and thank you so much for this interview, Peter Vronsky. Uh, hi, Dan. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much for joining me once again with this incredible American Serial Killers. Uh, tell us just the genesis of this book and what you intended to prove, I guess, and, and determine with this American Serial Killers. Well, it's been a long time in the making. Um, certainly, I became aware myself of... Uh, um, serial killers during this this era um, after I had quite a random, very briefly encountered an unapprehended serial killer in December of 1979 in, in New York City. And um, it was a dramatic encounter. He was fleeing the scene of a double homicide that he had committed in a, a hotel. He had beheaded two sex workers in his room, um, set their torsos on fire, and then fled with the heads. And as he was doing that, he held up the elevator, which really annoyed me because I was in the lobby trying to go up and take a look at this hotel, whether I wanted to stay there or not. You know, this was a rough period in New York's history. You wouldn't check into a, a hotel you're not familiar with it um, without first looking around. So, uh, you know, he probably held up the elevator for maybe 40 seconds tops, but I'm 23. I'm impatient. And, and so he annoys me. And when the elevator starts coming down, I, you know, I gave him this kind of hard look. So I had a good look at him. When I went up to walk through the hotel, I, I chose the floor that at random that he had been on the top floor. And, and, of course, at that point, um, I walked into the smoke coming from the torsos that he had set on fire. I never ended up staying there. I ended up, you know, evacuating out of the hotel and left as the fire department was arriving. So uh, that was my first encounter. Um, who it was, I later learned um, about almost eight months, nine months later, he had been arrested and I saw his pictures and I realized, you know, who it was I encountered on the elevator. And he was this ordinary looking guy, Richard Cottingham, the Times Square Corso killer. And so uh, I'm fascinated with what the hell this was. And the term serial killer did not exist at that time, uh, certainly not in public usage. Uh, law enforcement had been using it amongst themselves, but newspapers didn't use it. Um, it really doesn't enter into our popular lexicon until May of 1981 when the New York Times uses that uh, term to describe Wayne Williams, the child murderer in Atlanta. So, uh, you know, not having that word made me kind of gave left an impression of almost like a supernatural monster and Alfred Hitchcock movie serial killer. I mean, serial killers have been in our consciousness certainly since easily since Jack the Ripper, 1888, and long before that. But 
um, we didn't really have a word for them. And without the word, there was no concept. We called them recreational killers. We referred to them as stranger on stranger killers. Sometimes we call them as mass killers, which of course today has a whole different meaning than it did when that term was used. So I didn't have any of those concepts to kind of comfort me in understanding what it was that I, I, I had encountered. And, and so it was this lifelong fascination with these monsters. And as the word serial killer entered into our um, lexicon, I, I kind of realized what that was, but remained fascinated with their history, their origins and, and so forth. And, uh, you know, when I retired from uh, television production and decided to take a shot at writing a book, you know, they say, write what you know, and that's what I started off with and really haven't looked back since. I think this is maybe my fourth book on serial killers and, and this era of the 1970s and 19, uh, 1970s to 19, uh, the end of 1990s, when we had um, something like about 82% of all serial killers in the 20th century appear just in these three decades. It, it clearly was an epidemic and was called an epidemic at that time. Um, you know, the, the Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Dahmer, Richard Ramirez, the Hillside Stranglers um, era of serial killers. Um, uh, you know, some some approximately 2,300 serial killers identified in that um, era. That's a lot of serial killers. And, right. and so... I've been writing about serial killers for about 20 years now. And, you know, I never really took a hard look at exactly this. And, and no one has. No one has really written a history of this three-decade era. And, and so after doing Sons of Cain, where, I, you know, there were several chapters that I looked at this era, I, I still felt I had a book in me just about the whole era. So I look kind of at the ramp up of starting from 1950, essentially where you start beginning to see the steady rise of serial homicides in the United States. And then with the 1970s, you suddenly have this surge that um, essentially will run until the mid-1990s when we begin to see the first time not only a decline in the number of serial killers being apprehended, but as well, in general, um, murders and violent crime in the United States begins to um, dramatically drop at that point. Let's talk about the impetus and the genesis of this surge of serial killing in the 70s and the 90s, you say that there was some seeds planted and that there are uh, social and cultural and historical reasons for this, and you provide those. Yes. Uh, tell us, for, yes. as you've discovered, some of the, the reasons for the rise of this phenomenon. Well, my hypothesis is going to be one of a you know a historian I, I i don't claim to be an expert or profiler of um, serial killers I'm, you know my expertise is in their history and so we including myself in my earlier books always associated you know this surge in the 1970s to the 1990s with a general change in American culture that begins in the 1960s. Um, you know, we have the civil rights struggle and uh, the kind of upheavals around that. We have uh, the Vietnam War protests. We have the emergence of youth culture. We have um, the sexual revolution, the kind of um, disintegration of the nuclear family and um, uh, you know, th there is a rise, as I say, in, in violence and disorder in general in American society. And so we often associated serial murder with that um, period and with contemporary serial killers at that time. The problem with this model is that on average, 
the serial killer kills their first victim around the age of 27, 28. But their obsessions, their psychopathology begins developing as early as the age of five. And often you have a kind of a complete cycle by the time they're around the age of 14. Um, and, and so that means that if we're going to look at you know, Ted Bundy, for example, you got to back him out of the era in which he was committing his murders to the era in which he was a child, right. when he's being kind of formed. And, and that, of course, brings us back, you know, 20, 25 years. Uh, Ted Bundy, typically of that generation, is born in 1946. Um, and, and so we got to look at not only the culture and time in which children who will become serial killers are being raised, but as well at the parents to that family and what was affecting the family at that time, in particular the fathers. And, And of course, that gives us these two American traumas, the Great Depression and the Second World War. Uh, combined right. together, it, it, it has an impact on both males and um, females. Certainly, you have a generation of males who lose their sense of pride in the Great Depression when they are no longer the breadwinners that they were. Um, a lot of men could not really handle that and, and just abandon their families. Um, and, um, you know, you have now... Uh, generation of women that had to single-handedly bring up their children. And one thing we do see, and there are various psychological explanations for it, but one thing we do see in many serial killer biographies, not in all, but in, in many, is the presence of a kind of a controlling, dominant um, mother. That would be the expression, you know, we might use. What, right. uh, you know, more politely put, what we're seeing is, of course, independent, assertive women that have to play both the role of father and, and, and mother. And that right. is only more intensified by the Second World War as the husbands begin to leave um, and, and women are single-handedly raising children. And, of course, when the husbands return from the Second World War, they're not the same. And we completely underestimated the trauma that our fathers and grandfathers went through in the Second World War. We think it was like it's portrayed in the movies. And it wasn't at all that. Sure. Um, and, and, you know, I discovered that astonishing 37% of GI ground combat troops deployed in World War II were discharged and sent home as neuropsychiatric casualties. 37%. Wow. Uh, so that's a, a, a huge amount. And we didn't have um, the kind of diagnosis we have of post-traumatic stress disorder in the post-Vietnam War era. Um, we had these vague terms, combat, stress reaction, CSR, battle fatigue, battle neurosis, but we didn't understand what it was. And basically, um, traumatized soldiers come home, they're told to just suck it up. There's no treatment. There's no understanding of what they were experiencing. And as I looked at that era of serial killers, I began to, you know, collect these accounts of serial killers describing, you know, their fathers, particularly those who served in the Pacific, coming back from the war and and just totally disconnected from them, their family, just in this kind of sullen silence in in which they, you know, had to suffer. So that adds yet another level to um, the childhoods of these young males that are born in the baby boomer generation. Adding to that, on top of it, it's never one thing. Adding to that, we have this ubiquitous popular literature 
um, in the form of true detective magazines and um, pulp advent, men's pulp adventure magazines that, well, first of all, were sold mainstream next to Life magazine, Time magazine, Ladies Home, you know, Home and Garden Journal, and so forth, um, which depicted and celebrated the abduction, restraint, torture, rape, and murder of women. Um, it, uh, you know, the detective magazines often featured a model who posed in the photograph. Um, she was bound. She um, was, um, you know, her clothing was in a sense of disorder. None of these were blatantly pornographic. But um, clearly the implication was here that this is an, a woman who's abducted, tortured, raped, sexually assaulted, and will probably be murdered. And often the victim in these cover magazines looked out at the buyer of the magazines. It was, you know, you could have her for the price of the magazine was essentially right. the, the message. And, um, and the same thing with the men's adventure magazines, except the, the covers were painted rather than posed photographically. So um, by the 1950s, as homicide investigations of serial homicides uh, begin to unfold, um, the presence of these magazines and kind of scripts from these magazines become evident in um, some of these cases. Particularly, I describe in my book the case of Harvey Glattman, who, who was so obsessed with these magazines that he actually would lure in Los Angeles um, of freelancing photo models telling them that he had an assignment to shoot a true detective magazine cover and he would pose them as if they were in a true detective magazine cover and then enter into the cover and do what he wanted with them they killed a number of women that way and those photographs are um, you know, survived. And at that time, those photographs of, you know, actually a serial killer's victim in the process of being victimized were published throughout the United States. They still circulate on the internet today and, and they're absolute duplicates of what Harvey Glassman was seeing in these two detective magazines. He as well was um, subscribing to um, bondage literature as, as well, which also wasn't um, you know, technically pornographic either, right? So this, this now, on top of kind of the parental trauma, whatever, you know, serial killers experience, there's a whole matrix of things that happen to children who become serial killers, plus these magazines begin to kind of give them a script on which to express their obsessions, express their compulsions. So it's not that these magazines necessarily made them into serial killers, but it inspired what they would do, their their script. Um, you know, other serial killers are inspired by biblical passages. Um, you know, Dennis Radar, the BTK killer, described how he would be turned on by Bullwinkle cartoons, um, you know, the, the, the ones that right. um, featured Dudley Durag, the RCMP, uh, the, the, mm -hmm. the Mountie, who's rescuing Nell. Um, Nell is often bound and tied to a railway track by the villain. Right. And Dudley do right comes to rescue her. Well, right. Dennis Rader described how, you know, he was aroused by these cartoon images of now being tied to the railway track. So anything, anything can inspire a, a you know, budding serial killer in expressing already what's inside of them, what's brewing. In, in, inside of them and gives them shape, it gives it form. And of course, that's what profilers begin to focus in on in the 1970s. Um, they begin to discern certain patterns, certain imprint signatures, as they call it. Um, and those signatures come from our culture, from our era. You know, you know when I looked at serial murder in the 19th century, for example, um, you know, there was a period where serial killers had um, an obsession with servant girls, 
the way later serial killers have an obsession with sex workers, right? So um, servant girls and the type of silk clothing they, they wore. Um, so in the early, you know, from about 1800 to about 1850, 1860, you had a number of serial killing cases where the victims were servant girls. They were lured um, into some remote place, and often they were killed for their clothing. And and the whole servant girl fetish, in fact, is still with us today. I mean, you know, walk through the aisles of the costume department in any um, kind of adult um, novelty store, and there you'll see the you know servant girl costume. It's it's um, still a theme in kind of sexual play. You talked about the the scripts becoming. Uh, more involved and more and in incorporating and exhibiting more complex and extreme fetishistic fetishistic elements and uh, and necrophilic mutilations as well. Um, and you say this by the '30s, these scripts are becoming more elaborate and uh, and incorporating these things that we hadn't seen previously. In the run up to the '70s and the '90s, you cite certain examples of of particular killers that were, and then just as you mentioned about Glattman, meanwhile, you talked about Glattman being featured in a true detective magazine and Dennis Rader finding a true detective magazine in his father's truck, apparently, and being influenced and seeing, geez, look at, these are the kinds of things I've been dreaming of. So the yes, exactly. groundwork for exactly. groundwork for some of the things that you saw in the sexual serial murderers from the 70s and 90s, the infamous ones, were were the groundwork was laid before, wasn't it? Yes, absolutely. And, 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 and the groundwork is laid, of course, when these crimes were being committed, when these guys were children, indeed. Um, Dennis Radar, in fact, um, says that he was around 14 years old when in his father's truck he picked up a true um, detective magazine and it was actually the Harvey Glattman case with those photographs that were published everywhere um, that suddenly captured his attention. And we can see it kind of an escalation from the kind of more innocent um, now the cartoon figure tied to the rails to now an actual photograph of a bound woman that Harvey Gladman used to resynthesize the fake detective magazine covers. And, and now you have the next generation, uh, Dennis Radar, who begins to reenact these kinds of bondage scenarios, often using himself as a, as a model in them. He, he uh, kind of uses himself as almost a three-dimensional um, image of his fantasy, he imagines himself being actually the the woman. Um, so it's, it's a very kind of creepy, circular, um, psychological process that eventually spins out of just being inside the mind of the serial killer. It spins out of that into an actual murder when he takes it on the road, essentially. And again, that statistically begins to occur around the age 27, 28. Um, you know, that's when many of serial killers really mature into it. That's the term we might use, mature into, you know, real serial killers who are no longer just fantasizing about it, but are doing it. But the fantasies are often decades old, slowly evolving. What are the, some of the factors that you cite to enable some of the numbers? Because that's one of the important aspects of, of the phenomenon of 70s to the 90s was the incredible numbers of victims. What were some of the factors that you cite that would enable these serial killers to rack up these kinds of big numbers? I think firstly, just a basic lack of knowledge and, you know, that we don't even have a definition for what it is they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest problem facing law enforcement then and still to this day, um, to a great extent, was the problem of linkage blindness. 
right. where you had, you know, murders in different jurisdictions and jurisdictions did not communicate with each other. You also had murders in the same jurisdiction that uh, were linked together. Uh, police investigators in the 1960s had a much more simplistic notion of sexual murders. And, um, you know, if if somebody, say, for example, uh, you know, strangled an adolescent girl, but then um, uh, maybe suffocated a teenager, it was considered to be too different for it to be the same perpetrator. Uh, right. And, and so, you know, serial killings weren't linked. And I'm working on a particular case right now um, as an investigative historian with jurisdictions in New York and um, in New Jersey. In fact, dealing with the serial killer that I had encountered uh, way back in 1979. I'd, I'd been introduced to him um, several years ago by the daughter of a victim. And um, the, you know, some of his cases, which are now being closed, last year I announced that three cases from 1968 and 69 of schoolgirls in New Jersey, he confessed to those killings. And at that time, the media kind of made possible links between these murders, but there was no official position that these are serial murders. And when I um, reviewed the case, the cases, I, I was given, they all occurred in the same county, in Bergen County, New Jersey, and I was given an opportunity to review his confession and compare it to the actual case files. There was nothing in the case files that suggested that the murder in the next town was um, connected to this other uh, murder. It just was inconceivable to police and often is inconceivable today, uh, you know, because serial homicide, despite kind of the prominence it has in our culture and in our entertainment and, and, and so forth, it's an extraordinarily rare crime um, and, and more so today. And so often there is a resistance in uh, policing to jump to the serial killer scenario. It's one that a police, and they have good reason to usually contemplate as the last possibility. And we had that problem here in Toronto a few uh, years ago with the Bruce MacArthur murders. These were right. um, murders of um, you know gay males who had a similar ethnic background. They vanished in the gay community here, and um, you know the police were very resistant to declaring this as a serial homicide case because they simply didn't have you know any evidence confirming that and 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 so without that solid evidence the by police departments essentially is you know this is not a serial murder until we have evidence even though they suspected it was that and investigated it as that and eventually when they found the evidence you get had the apprehension but uh, you know there's there's an inquiry now as to whether the Toronto police should have treated this in a different way um, so there is a reluctance, as I say, to declare something as a serial murder case un unless they have just absolute evidence like, you know, DNA, for example. Right. Let's use this, Peter, as an opportunity to stop for a second to hear from our sponsor, which is FabFitFun. FabFitFun Spring Box is centered around the theme Grow Forth, supporting self-care and self-growth in the new season ahead. My wife Lisa and I are planning to grow forth into the spring season by reconnecting with old friends and getting back into hobbies and activities that we enjoy and just have neglected. My wife Lisa was so excited to get her FabFitFun spring box and wanting to get a head start this year for planting seeds for our garden. And so she was anxious to get her LED indoor planter by short stories and get started planting seeds, seeds for our garden this, this summer. Lisa loves all the fat fit fun items relating to skin care, like grown alchemist body cream with mandarin and rosemary leaf, 
Josie Moran, 100% pure argan oil. Lisa loved her Super Eye Serum by Verso with Retinol 8. And pure, iconic, glow, moisturizing face and body dry oil. Lisa literally relies on all of these FabFitFun and their marvelous health and beauty products they deliver to our door. 20 female-founded brands are in the spring box this season. You can choose from a wide variety of products when you order. Receive seasonal must-haves without leaving home. This FabFitFun spring box is still exciting for Lisa to receive even after receiving FabFitFun boxes for almost four years now. Lisa tells everyone she encounters about the amazing products and the incredible value and the perks of membership. Order your spring box today. Sign up now so you can snag amazing products like the LED Indoor Planner by Short Stories or Verso Super Eye Serum when you customize. Use coupon code MURDER for $10 off your first box at www.fabfitfun.com. Use coupon code MURDER for $10 off your first box at www.fabfitfun.com. Now, Peter, we were talking about the police and their difficulty even wrapping their minds around the phenomenon of serial killing until, it's, uh, until they had a confession or they had some overwhelming evidence that put this together. And we didn't talk, and you do talk about, we didn't mention, but you do talk about the FBI when they finally became a clearinghouse for serial murder, when they first became involved in any serial murder, and also the rise of profiling and the mind hunters. Yes, well, indeed, um, a homicide is not really in the jurisdiction of um, the FBI. Um, uh, you know, they, they, of course, the FBI investigates primarily federal crimes. Um, mm -hmm. They will investigate when a victim might be taken across state lines. Or if a murder, you know, occurs, a number of murders across state lines. But, uh, you know, we see kind of the image, popular image of the FBI rushing to these um, serial murder cases. But that is not the case. Uh, if they make an appearance, it's often they're invited in. So mm -hmm. the behavioral sciences unit in the 1960s was primarily formed to deal with um, hostage takers and uh, the psychology applied to talking down a hostage taker um, or hijacker. And at that period, this was shortly after Hoover had um, passed away, J. Edgar Hoover, uh, the behavioral sciences unit, FBI agents, they also were um, teaching in Quantico, the academy there. Um, they would give various courses on criminal psychology for visiting police and, um, detectives who were, you know, upgrading their qualifications. And they were encouraged to, like on a campus, on a civilian university, to carry out their own um, research. And, and, and so um, a number of uh, these behaviorists began to notice that there's this increase of serial homicides. They didn't quite know, again, you know, what to call it. They had all different names mm -hmm. for it. Um, Robert Resler eventually, um, and, and I think most historians have kind of settled on the Robert Resler version of how that term was coined. Robert Resler said it came to him when he was lecturing in in, in England, in fact, um, at the police academy there, he used the term serial, and it was inspired by um, Saturday afternoon serials, cliffhangers. And he right. described serial murder as kind of that kind of cliffhanger where the perpetrator commits the murder, but is left unsatisfied by it, kind of a, a cliffhanger. He wants to see the next episode or, or commit the next episode. And so Resler says that in the mid-70s, that inspired that, that term, serial killer. But these guys began to 
in the way that they were um, interviewing hostage takers and, you know, why did they surrender and things like that, they began privately interviewing serial killers as well and mass killers um, and um, uh, assassination uh, assassins, attempted assassins as well. And, and right. so Resler, John Douglas, that late generation began this intensive series. They got a, a, a grant to um, make this official now, we began interviewing serial killers. They, they, I think they interviewed something like 32 um, serial sexual murders and maybe another four or five sexual murderers who weren't serial killers. Um, they engaged a forensic nurse and Burgess to give them kind of a, a, um, an academic disciplined approach to this research project. And so they started in the late 70s. And 1986, they published their results it's uh, kind of this monumental book still is, um, is sexual serial murder um, patterns and motives is, is uh, the title. This becomes kind of almost a handbook for profilers. Um, they right. categorized serial killers as either organized or disorganized or um, mixed category serial killers. Um, I should say, by the way, FBI profilers today don't use that model. That's just in the movies. Um, you know, nobody comes to a scene and says, you know, this is an organized or disorganized. You know, that, that's, that's not the model that's, uh, that's used. But at that time, it was the first attempt to, first of all, name the phenomenon um, and, and so serial killer, you know, becomes that, that term, um, and, you know, uh, Anne Rule's book on Ted Bundy, which I think is kind of the seminal true crime book that introduces us to the notion of a serial killer. Um, when that book was published at first time in 1980, the term serial killer never appears in it. Imagine a book on Ted Bundy without the word serial killer in it. <laughs> Um, yeah. So um, they now create this kind of diagnosis and what's expected of the organized, disorganized serial killer. And, 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 and so that's how the behavioral sciences unit comes into um, this, this position as kind of a clearinghouse on serial murder. And, and, and of course, as well, um, at that point in time, um, politicians began to dig into this. And, and, and so there is this kind of call, especially after Ted Bundy, a call for kind of a centralized database system where um, unsolved homicides, data on them can be entered into this database, various characteristics, perhaps being able to make a, a match to other serial killers. Um, and so you get the birth of VICAP, um, this, this database, which actually is not, again, used as often as it's, um, you know, purported to be in popular literature or, or, or the movies. And, and so there's very few, if any, serial killers that have been apprehended solely by the virtue of profiling. You know, profiling is a good tool. It helps. Um, it particularly helps once you have a suspect in mind. Uh, you know, does he come near the profile? It helps as well in interviewing the suspect. There, uh, you know, there's a psychological approach that um, a certain type of serial killer might be more vulnerable uh, too. So, you know, that behavioral issue is important to uh, policing, but it's not the magic bullet that uh, we see portrayed in Hollywood or on television. But definitely these congressional hearings, um, that's where the term serial killer epidemic is actually used in these congressional hearings, in particular, the question of missing children. Um, there were these um, allegations, and, and of course, John Welsh from America's Most Wanted, he, you know, his son 
was a murder victim, possibly a victim of a serial killer. And, and so uh, Walsh had testified before the congressional hearings, but Anne Rule did too, and, and they made some outlandish claims as to how many serial killers were out there and um, how many children were being abducted by um, serial killers. That helped, certainly those dramatic numbers helped the FBI get funding, but as Robert Resler himself later wrote, he said, you know, um, we needed the money, we just, you know, exaggerated the extent of, of, of the epidemic. And it turned out that most child abductions, um, in fact, are, you know, by, by family members or uh, people who are known to the children rather than strangers, the way it was, you know, implied during the, the, those hearings. But it brought funding from BICAP. It, um, you know, it, it's still running. It's still going. It's gone through several generations. I mean, you know, the problem with VICAP, of course, is firstly, uh, you know, it required the completion of very complicated and long form. There's like over a hundred questions and paperwork and cops don't mix very well. Uh, right. So very few police officers were ready to, uh, you know, fill out this long form, then mail it, right, and, and, and get nothing out of it. Eventually, once you everybody had you know desktop computers, you could now fill out this form on a piece of software. You can you know you rather than filling it out by hand on a typewriter or a typewriter, you can now do it on this piece of software and then fax the form. Um, the third kind of permeation was you can just now just go online and complete the form. But until the early 2000s, um, police departments could not query VICAP. You had to submit the form and then wait for VICAP to do the analysis and then send you the, the you know, their results. It, you know, individual police departments did not have access to the VICAP database. And that changed, um, the, you know, in, in the, say, Around 2005, somewhere in there, uh, police departments now are, 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 can tap into the, the master database themselves rather than waiting for FBI analysts um, to do that. But those things kind of hindered the use of VICAP. And so by the 2000s, a lot of new police officers who came on, uh, you know, um, enlisted in the, in the police weren't even aware of VICAP. Um, uh, you know, the FBI kind of stopped sending bulletins on it. They stopped sending um, FBI uh, agents to kind of brief police departments on what's available. And, and so it's in the 2000, around 2005 that the FBI kind of again restarted the bulletins on VICAP and 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 began informing officers or hey you know there is this tool that's available to you and and so forth so it had its ups and downs as as you know the whole profiling and it is an art essentially it's not exactly a a, a science it's kind of an art I guess the way you know psychiatry is kind of a little bit of um, intuitive understanding of your patient and their psychology and, you know, some degree of sciences on mental illness and, and, and so forth. The same thing applies to, to profiling. It's a bit of an art, it's a bit of a science, and it's only as good as um, the profiler themselves. And some people are better, um, are more adept at, at um, profiling, while others are not. So certainly it's a talent. Let's use this as an opportunity to stop for just a second for these messages. Now, you talked about the psychology of profiling and its development, but in this book, you also do the background on a lot of these infamous serial killers, and there seems to be a common characteristic in regarding head injuries. So let's talk about yes. the prevalence of the head injury and what that would mean 
in terms of uh, motivation for these types of crimes. Uh, let's talk about that. Before we talk about your theory about this throwback to uh, primordial time. Head injuries, certainly we've always known that there's kind of a behavioral um, uh, aspect to some head injuries, particularly frontal lobe injuries. We've known that since the 19th century. We just didn't have ways of um, measuring it or illustrating or documenting the actual effect of a head injury on the brain, which in the last 20, 30 years, we now developed, we can deep scan brains. Um, Dr. Keel in New Mexico is kind of the leading current um, forensic psychiatrist who is, has looked at uh, tens of thousands of brain scans of incarcerated inmates who tested positive for psychopathy. And he can now, he can actually look at a, at a brain scan and say this individual will test positive on the hair psychopathy test. There's a test we use, 40 questions that um, are not filled out by the subject, but actually are filled out by the analyst on a kind of behavioral issues and historical issues around a particular subject. And you score them on, on this 40 point mark and anybody who scores 25 or upwards would be technically diagnosed as, as a psychopath. This is a test that's used by parole boards, by sentencing boards, and, 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 and so forth. It's a Canadian, Dr. Hare, that came up, a Hare, H-A-R-E, came up with this um, test. And so Keel discovered that there are certain um, physical brain abnormalities similar to those that we began to recently see in NFL players who have as well frontal right. lobe injuries. Um, and so Kill suggests that a lot of serial killers are actually not psychopaths or organic psychopaths, but have induced psychopathy from head injuries. And we have all these anecdotal stories from serial killers of um, brain injuries, you know, from Richard Ramirez to William Herons to um, a lot of serial killers. There's a record of brain injuries, particularly frontal lobe injuries in their childhood history. But, uh, but now, over the recent decade, we can actually physically begin to make links between frontal lobe abnormalities and um, a psychopathy and, of course, criminal behavior, including serial homicide. So certainly in the, in the case of, uh, as I like to describe them, my serial killer, Richard Cottingham, um, one of the things that interested me ab uh, about him was his very stable childhood. I mean, here's an individual who, who uh, both his parents were uh, remained married. He came from a middle class family. He, um, you know, was a Boy Scout, a choir girl. He had uh, three younger sisters who absolutely uh, adored him right to the end. Couldn't believe that he was a serial killer. Um, and I, I couldn't figure out, you know, what the trauma was. And he certainly claimed to me that he had a completely normal childhood. There was nothing wrong in it. And, and indeed, I, I couldn't find anything. But doing a search of newspapers, remarkably, I discovered that there's actually a, a brain injury in his history when he's four years old. Um, it's so severe that it's reported in the newspapers. He's hit by a car, um, he runs head first into a car as a four-year-old kid and is taken, is serious enough that he's hospitalized. 
and 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 so you know even in the you know the one case the one serial killer with 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 whom I am having um, you know conversations with and interviewing and and dealing with this head injury scenario raises its its head um, whether it's as a result of injury or whether there is other causes for that kind of brain pattern is left to be seen but right now that that is the ex, you know the the current explanation because we've got a problem with the trauma model is that uh, you know um, uh, thousands millions of children um, grow up traumatized uh, subject to abuse all sorts of horrible things happen to them yet they don't necessarily become serial killers so what is it what is that X uh, factor and, and and that remains. The more we study serial killers, the less we appear to know. We still don't know uh, that X factor. And uh, I read every one of my books. I say I think it's too early for us to just rule out old-fashioned biblical evil, um, whatever that might be. Uh, you know, maybe one day we'll have a scientific term for it, an explanation, but. We still haven't figured out why so many traumatized children end up um, not being serial killers and the few that do. In this book, you cover, and of course, we haven't even touched on the examples that you provide in the book of of infamous serial killers like Dean Coral, uh, Calvin Jackson, uh, fairly unknown. You call it the House of Horrors killer. Not so well known at all. David Berkowitz, Rodney Alcala, um, infamous ones. Herbert Mullen, the Die Song Killer. Edmund Kemper, Arthur Shawcross. Uh, Shawcross. Um, we have uh, John Juan Corona. So you also provide some of these famous and not so famous cases and delve into them to show not only the influence of pornography and also the shift in society and culture and how that influenced their crimes and their behavior, but also dramatic examples like Jeffrey Dahmer. We don't have much time left in this interview, but can you tell us a little bit about Jeffrey Dahmer, some of the things that you've pointed to and discovered in his story that demonstrate some of the things that you have expressed in in, in not only your theory about serial killer surge, but also just your study of serial killers in general. Well, certainly, I mean, Jeffrey Dahmer is on that extreme end because he's um, getting into a very primitive thing, cannibalism. Um, and, uh, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer, there's two kinds of cannibalism. There's, you know, nutritional cannibalism. You've got to eat and there's nothing else um, but your fellow human being. And then you have kind of ritual pathological cannibalism where this cannibalism kind of is, is inspired by a primitive urge, but is not for nutritional purposes. It's, it, it, it fulfills some other need. And, in the case of Jeffrey Dahmer, I mean, this was an individual who struggled to not to kill. Um, he, he was killing essentially to keep the objects of his love close to him. Um, he didn't like to be left. And, 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 and so, um, you know, at first he attempts, he keeps um, a mannequin with him and, and, you know, he uses this mannequin kind of as a sex doll, but his grandmother finds it and forces him to get rid of it. But he's struggling not to be killing people. And it's not about killing for him. It's about having these people. In fact, he had one way he attempts not to kill his victims is he attempts to inject battery acid into the brain of one of his victims in the hope that he can just zombify them and keep them in this zombie state without taking their life. Um, and of course, it doesn't work. And, and so eventually he begins to resort to cannibalism to keep these people with him. It's the ultimate um, taking of a, a person. So he is collecting these corpses that become his love dolls. 
the killing for him is not part of his obsession. It doesn't give him any pleasure at all. It's a chore. It's it's just keeping these people. And, and of course, cannibalism is a very primitive urge, um, as is fighting, um, as is the sexual reproductive impulse. And, and um, if you take these urges and strip away you know, cities and civilization, and you just throw human beings into the jungle or into the cave without any of these um, kind of uh, structures of civilization, uh, you know, we are left in an animal state. And what do animals do other than, you know, have sex, eat, and fight, and run away? You know, um, I called it the four acts fleeing, hiding, feeding, and fucking. These are essential to the survival and evolution of any species. And, um, you know, it's, we've essentially only been civilized out of, you know, it, it, anthropologists kind of um, have a very wide swath about how long our species of human beings, Homo sapiens, have been around. Uh, you know, some say it's around a hundred, a uh, hundred thousand years. Others say, you know, as, as long as a million years. But we know one thing that um, we've only become civilized in approximately the last twelve thousand years. It's a drop in the bucket. Prior to that we were living out there like cats and dogs and every other kind of animal species, including cockroaches. And, and we were all in order to survive capable of fleeing, fighting, feeding, and, you know, fornicating. Um, otherwise, if any one of those functions ceased, we wouldn't get around today. Our species would be gone. And, and so I don't think um, 12,000 years is enough long enough for us to have been, um, you know, kind of mother nature taking that out of our um, human character, our instinct. We still have that instinct. Um, I certainly remember as a child, my fellow children being extremely violent. Um, you know, there was a lot of biting and scratching and, and um, aggression, you know, among my playmates, certainly. And so I, I think we're all born with these impulses and instincts and it's socialization that essentially um weaves that instinct out of us it it, it um you know the rules morality religion law um society begins to instill in us inhibitions we're almost domesticated so to speak um and and so my argument is is probably we're all born um, in the infantile stage as these um, bundles of um, potentially raping, killing, cannibalistic um, existences that we have to get unmade from. And, and so what serial killers are essentially is a failure in the unmaking of our primitive state. That's basically my argument in um, Sons, of, Sons of Cain, that serial killers are not made. They're actually, you know, where the rest of us are unmade from being that. You talk about all of the reasons, and we've talked about some of those, for this surge of serial killing between the 70s and the 90s, and you provide the reasons and the precursors and, and the, 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 the rise up before the, the, the 50s to the 2000s and, and some of the infamous perpetrators. With giving the reasons for and the and the genesis of of those serial killers from the seventies and nineties, what do you predict for the future based on those same theories? Yeah, yeah. If my hypothesis is correct, um, it's not going to be a bright future because we have similar equivalents recently to the things that I associate with this surge. Um, we have in 2008, we have a economic catastrophe very much as deep and as um, injurious as the Great Depression was. 
Um, a lot of families were destroyed by that 2008 crash. Um, a lot of children uh, uh, lost their homes, uh, ended up, uh, you know, being raised in motels. Um, we have as well a, a um, war that is a war on terror and there, therefore is kind of as clandestine in a way as the trauma of the Second World War was. And during the Second World War, there was a kind of a cultural thing that soldiers, you know, were not encouraged to talk about when they got home about what, they, you know, really happened. And, of course, the war on terror is a clandestine war also drops this kind of cone of silence on the soldiers that fighted it. Um, often they come home and by virtue of the nature of that war, they can't talk about it. Um, Moreover, it's not just the fathers who are coming home, but now um, it's the mothers as well who sometimes go into combat and and um, experience this this war. So there you have right away the double combination that I link the you know 60s, 70s, the, the growing baby boomer generation serial killers to you have a similar kind of scenario. Um, but it even gets worse because now we have um, the trauma of COVID. Uh, this is, uh, you know, we don't know yet what kind of psychological impact it's going to have on right. uh, the young and the children. So um, we'll know in about 15 uh, years, 20 years, um, whether my hypothesis is, is, I hope I'm wrong. You know, because if I'm not, right. then, um, you know, that serial killer surge we saw between the 70s and 1990s is going to look like a day at the beach compared to what's coming at us. Oh, absolutely. I want to thank you very much, Peter Vronsky, for coming on and talking about your incredible new book, American Serial Killers, The Epidemic Years, 1950 to 2000. I know that the book is released today, so thank you so much for coming on for this interview. Is there a website, Amazon page, that people might refer to to find out more information? Well, well I have a website, petervronsky.org um, and petervronsky.com. Um, it links to my books and my work and my bio and so forth. And otherwise, the book is available anywhere you would um, buy books on Amazon, iBooks, um, uh, you know, bookstores will, will carry it. It's, it's out in the hardcover. It's my first hardcover book as opposed to kind of a trade soft cover edition. Mm -hmm. So it is out in the hardcover and it's out as well um, in ebook form on Kindle and, and so forth. So um, it, it, it's available everywhere books are so. Well, thank you so much, Peter Vronsky, American Serial Killers, The Epidemic Years, 1950 to 2000. Thank you so much for this interview. You have a great evening. Good night. Thanks, Dan, and thanks for having me on. Good night.